Well, hello, my friends. It's the Christmas season. And for some of you, it is simply the most wonderful time of the year. But for many, well, December can be tough. It can be stressful. It can be challenging. It can be lonely. I'm wondering if you'd allow me an opportunity to try to encourage you today with this thought. Christmas time really is a season of hope because of God's greatest gift to humanity, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Can I invite you to join me throughout the month of December? May we take a few moments and celebrate the coming of Christ with a special Advent series based in part on my book, Because of Bethlehem. It features a sermon series that I shared with my church I sure hope you'll enjoy it. And most of all, I hope you'll remember that Jesus Christ really is the reason for the season. May you be blessed as you listen. He, speaking of Christ, God, he made himself what? Nothing. He emptied himself or other translations. He made himself nothing. He made himself hungry. He made himself small. He made himself dependent upon legs, larynx, lungs. He made himself dependent upon a mother's milk. He made himself nothing. When he was tired, he was really tired. When he asked, how long must I put up with you? He was really frustrated. When he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He really wanted an answer. He made himself nothing. He took on human form. He divested himself for a time of his divine nature and took on human nature. He said, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. In other words, I speak only as God reveals to me. He made himself dependent upon the revelation of God. And if God did not reveal something to him, he, like we, was left with no answer. An example of this has to do with the second coming. He said, on that day, of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. In other words, Jesus Christ confessed he did not know. He divested himself of divine knowledge. The one who made everything for a time made himself nothing. And the apostle says that Jesus did not view his equality with God as something to be grasped. Something to be grasped. This is an interesting phrase. It doesn't appear anywhere else in the Greek Bible. It describes Jesus' reluctance to take advantage of his heavenly status. A loose translation might be, he did not throw his weight around. He refused to demand special treatment. He did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited or boasted about. When people mocked him, he didn't turn them into stones. When they spat on him, he didn't boomerang saliva into their faces. When people called him crazy, he didn't strike them blind. Just the opposite. He became obedient, Paul says, to death, even death on a cross. He was at nature God. He made himself nothing. He became obedient to death, and as if that's not enough, even death on a cross. I'm not sure we can fully appreciate like the Philippian readers could that statement. They lived in the Roman Empire. And they understood that death by crucifixion was reserved for the lowest of the lowest class of people and the most hardened and despicable of criminals. 
It was regulated only by the morality of the executioner, and you know there wasn't much morality there. The one being crucified was tortured. He was whipped. He was often impaled. He was nailed to a cross. He was stripped naked. And he was left to hang in a public place, not in a private place, but in a public place so people could mock him and fathers could point at him and tell their children, don't grow up to be like that person. He became a public example of what good people do to bad people. Jesus humbled himself from the point of being the one who made creation to the point of being obedient unto death, yes, even death on a cross. It cannot be stated too often or too clearly that was God on that cross. That was God who took the nails. That was God who felt the spit. That was God who felt the spear. That was God, how far he would go. He made himself nothing. He submitted himself even to death, even death on a cross. Why would he do this? Dr. Maltz helps us find an example. Dr. Maxwell Maltz was a prominent plastic surgeon who tells a story of a lady who came to him for help. Her husband's face had been burned and badly disfigured when he tried to rescue his parents from a burning house. He failed in his rescue attempt, and he assumed that God was punishing him because he failed, and he sequestered himself and, and, and refused to come out into public. And so the wife went to the doctor. The doctor said, oh, I can help him. With the advances of plastic surgery, we can restore his faith, face. And she said, well, he won't talk to anyone. So I'm wondering, would you do to me what the fire did to him? Would you so disfigure my face that when he sees my face, he sees a semblance of his, and maybe he will let me back into his life? Well, the doctor refused. But he demanded an opportunity to visit with the man and so he knocked on the door of the man, man's house. He said, I know you're in there, when no one answered. I'm Dr. Maxwell Maltz. I'm a plastic surgeon. I can restore your face. Still no response. And he said through the closed door, your wife came to see me. She wants me to disfigure her face to look like yours so that you will welcome her back into your life. And after a few moments, the doorknob turned, and the man opened the door. And he began to receive treatment and actually began a new chapter of life, all prompted by the incredible love of one who would become like him so that he would turn back to her. God did that for you, my friend. God did that for you. You have hands, he had hands. You have a neck, he took on a neck. You have cranky neighbors, he had cranky neighbors. You have cold winters, hot summers, he felt them all. Why? So you would know he knows what it's like to be you. He became like you with the hope that you would trust him and become like him.